Uh, guests, assalamu alaikum, good evening, and good morning. Welcome to IPS Recover webinar series where we present evidence uh, on COVID-19 related policies and programs through rigorous research. Today, we are going to share evidence on adolescents of Bangladesh um, the, during the time of COVID-19. We are jointly organizing this with uh, A2I and the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Program. I'm Ashraful Haq, Country Director of IPA Bangladesh, and I will be your host today. Next. A few uh, housekeeping um, issues that I want to remind you before we go into the presentation. Uh, please remain yourself on mute when you are not speaking. But I understand that sometimes we have burning questions in our minds. So if you have some, please, uh, there is an option to raise your hand and we will get back to you. Also, you can use the chat box uh, and you can type your question and send there. We'll get back to you. Also, our researchers, if you feel to respond using chat box, you can do it as well. Uh, when speaking, please introduce yourself and your organization. You are welcome to keep your video on, but please remember we are recording this meeting. Next, please. So a big question is why we are interested to share evidence on adolescence at this particular point in time. Roughly one fourth of our population are adolescents. And if this significant population are negatively impacted by COVID-19, then we are looking at long lasting intergenerational negative effect. Unless we address these negative effects carefully, through research and through carefully designed policies and programs. To do that, we need uh, to share data and evidence with the policymaker so that they can take those into account and, 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 and make policies that might help to mitigate some of these COVID-19 negative impacts. For example, we really think, need to think about bringing our boys and girls back to schools and mitigate learning losses that they incurred already. So our goals today are twofold. One, we want to share policy relevant data directly with you in your capacity as a policymaker in the government, NGOs, or funding organizations. And we don't want our relationship to stop after this meeting. We want to develop and foster a space where we can continue productive dialogue between us so that we can do rigorous research that can help policies during this tough time. Next. Today, we will present findings from three studies. Each study will present the, the, their findings uh, five, uh, 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a short policy discussion. Next. Uh, some of uh, you in the audience might not know IPA, um, who we are and how we work. So please give me 10 seconds to explain what we do. So IPA is a nonprofit together with academics and policymakers in the NGOs in, within the government. We identify pressing development issues and then think about potential alternative solutions. Once we find some solutions, we evaluate those solutions to know what works and why. Often we use randomized control trial to find, to evaluate those uh, uh, solutions. The rigorous method that has been used in medical science to test the efficacy of medicines for quite a long time. Once we evaluate a particular policy, we take this new found evidence to the policymakers and directly work with them. To <laughs> Uh, directly uh, help them to use those evidence when they make policies and programs. Next, please. IPA works in 22 countries, and in the last 18 years, we work with more than 700 development partners, including government agencies, and more than 600 academics globally, and we produced more than 850 evaluations across 51 countries. Next, please. In Bangladesh, we are working since 2011 and we produced 27 randomized control trials 
in many sectors that includes SMEs, education, governance, workers and factories, health and sanitation. Since the beginning of COVID-19, we are helping different government agencies through collecting panel data and conducting quick randomized control trials. For example, right now, one of our RCTs is looking into the effect of mask wearing at the community level and the remote learning initiatives undertaken by the Bangladesh government. Next, please. Let me introduce our researchers briefly. Uh, Dr. Sarah Baird, she is an associate professor at George Washington University. Momoi Makino, she is a research fellow at Institute of Developing Economics. Dr. Shahana Nazneen, she is a qualitative researcher for Girls Empowerment Project. Next. Uh, Kate Vaiboni, she is a research associate at Duke University. Dr. Zakmi Wahas, he is a reader in economics at University of Kent. Our policy discussions today are Tasin Ahmed, he is Chief Executive Officer at USEP Bangladesh, Mohammad Afzal Hussain Sarwar, Policy Specialist at HY, Raihana Taslim, Project Director of Bangladesh uh, um, uh, Ministry of uh, Education, Bangladesh Government. Dr. Sajida Amin, Senior Associate at Population Council. Dr. Mahin Sultan from Brack University will be moderating all the uh, presentation, uh, research presentation today. I'm now handing over to Dr. Mahin Sultan. Mahin, Mahin up, please. Thank you very much, Ashraf Bhai. Good morning and good evening to different participants, depending on where you are. Um, we have a very, uh, very rich but very tight uh, program planned for this evening. So I will be helping keep to time so that we have uh, time for question and answer and a bit of discussion at the end. But we have uh, very interesting presentations and um, very experienced discussants who will be also reflecting on these presentations. So I think we should just jump into the presentations. The first one is by Dr. Sarah Baird who is with George Washington University and is also the quantitative lead of the um, Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Program. So over to you, Sarah, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mahin. Um, good morning, uh, good evening. Thanks very much for the opportunity to um, present our findings with you today. Um, I also wanna acknowledge my um, co-authors on the policy brief that this is based on, um, Svetlana Sabawal at the World Bank, Jennifer Seeger at George Washington University, Sil Sylvia Guglielmi of Gage and Mahin Sultan, who you just um, heard from. Uh, this work is uh, in partnership with IPA in Bangladesh um, and is funded by, by Gage um, with joint funding from the um, South Asian Gender Innovation Lab at the World Bank and IPA's uh, Women's Work Entrepreneurship and Skilling Initiative. This is gonna be a very quick uh, presentation, um, but um, hopefully many of you will join us for an event in May where, we'll, um, where Mahin Sultan is organizing to go in more detail into the gauge data. Uh, next slide. So the Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence Project is a gro global study following 20,000 adolescent girls and boys. Um, one of our focal countries is, is Bangladesh. We wanna we're focused on finding out what works for whom, where, and why, so we can better support adolescent girls and boys to maximize their capabilities now and in the future. With the onset of COVID-19, we've pivoted a lot of our research to virtual surveys to try and understand how COVID-19 is affecting the lives of young people globally. Next slide. So I think as many of you know, um, COVID-19 is, is rapidly disrupted all of our lives. While many of the direct health effects have been concentrated among the elderly, um, we all know that the virus will have multidimensional effects on young people, um, particularly the concerns around school closures, which um, you know, I think is acutely affecting adolescents in Bangladesh as schools remain closed, as well as the negative economic shocks. Um, for our sample in Bangladesh, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides, these um, girls and boys were all in school um, when COVID-19 came and about 50% of households report losing uh, employment permanently or temporarily as a result of COVID-19. 83% of households report some income lost. And so there's this clear uh, 
clear evidence that these adolescents have been acutely impacted both by the school closures and these negative economic shocks. And I think there's concerns that these impacts may be particularly acute for adolescent girls, which I believe we'll hear from all the speakers today. Next slide. Next slide. There's a sort of growing body of evidence um, suggesting that adolescents who are enrolled in school may now be engaged in paid work. I think this is particularly a concern for boys. They may be taking on larger roles in the household, um, facing pressures to marry, becoming pregnant, all a larger concern for girls. And these factors are going to constrain school return when schools reopen. This sort of expected gendered impact of these school closures echoes what we've seen from previous crises. But I think, you know, as we're finding COVID-19 is unique. And so I think we have a lot of work to do to understand the implications and ensure sort of a, a decisive and appropriate policy response. And I think particularly in Bangladesh, given the, the immense gains in particularly in girls' education, I think concerns that this is going to stunt all the progress that has been made. Next slide. So I want to just give a quick summary of our, our findings um, since we have, the time is short and I may not get through everything. So we collected data on a little over 2,000 in-school adolescents um, right before the onset of the pandemic. We've identified multidimensional impacts on food insecurity, anxiety, and mental health. Um, with serious adverse effects on adolescents, um, including decreased access to learning, increased time on spent on chores, and impacts on job aspirations. We believe this necessitates very sort of targeted policies and inter interventions, including remote learning methods, um, re-enrollment campaigns, nutrition and counseling programs, and training for, for teachers. And I'm sure our, our policy discussants um, will provide a lot more detail about um, possible policy responses. Next slide. So we, as I mentioned, sampled a little over 2,000 adolescents from Chittagong and Salette in Bangladesh, who were surveyed initially in February and March through face-to-face -face interviews before the pandemic hit. These adolescents were around 13 years of age in grades seven and six, and a little over half were female. Once the pandemic hit, we quickly pivoted to computer-assisted telephone interviewing with the help of IPA and conducted surveys in May and June, 2020. We actually are, can still in the field right now, um, but completed surveys for this sample in February and March, 2021, um, again, through computer assisted telephone interviewing. In round two, we reached about 97% of our sample. Um, so we're very successful in, in finding these adolescents, I think reflecting the, the high rates of phone penetration in this community. And it will focus largely on, the, on those results, but I will provide some comparisons in terms of how things have changed since May and June. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna look at findings on, on earning, sort of economic findings, education, job aspirations, and mental health and anxiety. So 83% of households report some income loss, as I mentioned, with some improvement as are observed between, you know, again, May, June, 2020, and just now. When we surveyed these households in May and June, 50% report losing employment um, permanently, but 60% of these households have now returned to work. 65% of households worried that they would not be able to meet basic household needs. And this has now decreased to 53%. 42% of households in May, June were not able to buy essential food items. And this has actually increased up to 75%. And so we can see that these households are still um, being adversely affected by the pandemic. Some things improving, some things getting worse. Next slide. When we look at food security, particularly focused on, on adolescents, about a third of households report cutting back food to adolescents in the household. And this compares to 13% right before the pandemic hit. We see small improvements this year um, with 24% of households reporting cutting back food, but that rate is still substantially higher than the same time last year. Almost 60% of adolescents report that their meals are less likely to contain protein since the onset of, of the pandemic. And there's a strong reported reduction in dietary diversity, diversity with most households um, in particular reporting reduced consumptions of meat. And I should have mentioned when I was mentioning the quantitative data that we have supporting qualitative data as well. Um, and so here's an example. Um, my father couldn't bring rice because of the earning loss during lockdown. I would eat lentils. He would try to bring this and that, but some days he couldn't bring anything at all. When he couldn't bring it, we wouldn't eat. When he would bring it, we'd eat then. And so I think um, clear that, that the economic shop is leading to um, food insecurity issues for households and the adolescents. Next slide. So we also characterize our households by vulnerable and non-vulnerable, basically thinking about a series of characteristics that would make them more vulnerable to COVID-19 using pre-COVID -co pre characteristics. 
And so the top uh, figure is looking at comparing vulnerable to non-vulnerable households. And you can see that it's it households that were vulnerable, more vulnerable prior to the pandemic is are feeling the, the hardest um, hit from the shock. On the other hand, when we look at gender in the bottom um, cohort slide, we actually are finding similar effects for, for men, for boys and girls when we look at, when we're looking at, at nutrition. So it's hitting everybody hard, regardless of, of gender of the adolescent. Next slide. Turning to education, um, all adolescents report doing something to continue learning. So they are trying to maintain some learning while schools are closed. The majority are spending time studying with their own books with only 22% actually being in contact with a school teacher. Some are using media. Um, and interestingly, there's actually higher rates of media use by girls than boys. And I think that's something we, we should disentangle more. And so again, however, even though they're doing their best to learn while schools are closed, um, it's difficult, right? So as this 14 year old girl so says, we lose electricity connection every time it is cloudy outside, right? So how can you engage in online learning when you're facing these challenges? Next slide. When we look at how much time people are spending on, on education, 50% report spending less time than before the lockdown and 94% report an increased time on household chores or childcare. And interestingly, this is for both boys and girls. So both boys and girls are saying that their domestic chores have increased. But I think it's important to note that although this is happening for both boys and girls, um, girls were already spending 50% more time on chores than boys before the pandemic. So for this, for them, this increase is on top of kind of pre-existing disparities. Next slide. We do also ask these adolescents whether they um, want to return to school and the majority of girls and boys believe they will be able to return to school. We also asked them, I will not be able to return to school. So trying to sort of get at the, the other side of the question. And one thing that's really interesting here is we see that girls are getting more pessimistic about their ability to return to school, even though the numbers are low and boys are getting more optimistic. And so I think that's something we'll wanna pay attention to. We also see that mothers are much more concerned about school return for their children than the adolescent themselves. Although that is improving slightly. Next slide. So I know I have about 30, 30 seconds. seconds. 30 seconds, yeah. yep. <laughs> so um, just very quickly on aspirations and goals, job aspirations are very high among this population. Most aspire to some sort of professional job, but close to half, so 40% identify financial constraints as a main challenge to achieving these aspirations. And so obviously this will be impacted by COVID. 40% of adolescents have goals they would like to achieve within the next year, most of which are education related. And interestingly, boys are much more likely to have goals than girls. Next slide. Um, we'll just skip this, but sort of household stress is, is high. Um, and I think, you know, something we need to pay attention to. Next slide. So I, I'll kind of leave this just quickly here, but I think there's lots of ways we can think about policies to, to get these kids back in school and support them financially. Um, but I'll leave it to the policy experts to talk more about this and next slide. And just finally, my email is here. Please feel free to contact me with any further questions. Um, and hopefully these, these slides will be shared, a link to the policy brief and a, a podcast. Um, thanks so much and, and look forward to your questions and the rest of this conversation. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's a very rich um, presentation and you're most welcome to follow up on the, on the brief and on the slides um, to go back and you know, read more about it. So um, I'd like to ask uh, Tasina Ahmed, who is now with um, USEP. Uh, her designation has changed. It is now Executive Director, Social Development Program, USEP Bangladesh. And uh, for those who don't know, USEP is one of the largest um, NGO vocational in, um, training programs uh, with institutions all over the country and brings a big experience of uh, working with children who have not been in school, trying to get them back to school, and also from school to the work transition. So, um, Tasina, some reflections on Sarah's presentation, please. Thanks very much to Sarah for this very important study, touching on a very critical issue in the present context of the country. It's an issue which the government, its development partners, and agencies like Yusef Bangladesh, which, close, which works very closely with children, adolescents, and youth, have been struggling with since the pandemic. The study very rightly highlights the implications of the pandemic on the lives of adolescents, especially in terms of mental health, economic losses, and food security, 
and the findings correspond largely with the experience and research conducted by UCE Bangladesh, where we found similar results in most cases. I strongly endorse the recommendations that Sarah has provided. For my deliberation in regard to back to school and from school to work, I take up the point three of the recommendation that getting children back to school won't be easy. This is actually very true. Uh, and in order to have greater success, I would just like to make a few points. First, the continuity of learning is essential. Technology and digitization have helped tremendously with imparting education and training during school or training institutions closures, but we also know that the limitation in regard to access to digital tools like TV, mobile phones, and so on for students from disadvantaged families have been very difficult. So alternative models must be developed for learning, for practical training and for assessments. UC Bangladesh developed a study group method for general schools and industry-based training models for technical training, um, for uh, higher technical training and general technical training. So efforts can be scaled up to identify such good practices and scale these up. Similarly, the capacity development of teachers, instructors, and guardians are critical. The continuity of learning will help keep children, guardians, and teachers, as well as instructors, motivated during this time, especially during the transition. Sarah mentions uh, uh, psychosocial counseling, and I would like to re-emphasize on this very important point. Uh, especially uh, in regard to how a child or a student will it, can actually manage oneself in the pandemic, whether opportunities in life will to grow, you know, will be limited and so on. There are so many issues that children and students are, are very worried about. So this psychological, so psychosocial counseling is essential. We have witnessed a raise in child labor and in child marriage as a consequence of the pandemic, and especially the lockdown. Efforts must be linked um, to strongly actually um, link with social safety net initiatives with any training or any education initiative so that parents are not compelled to choose between sending their children back to school or to getting them married off. So this is also a very critical point. When it comes to disadvantaged groups, there is a higher interest in short training courses, though through which youth can get into jobs and start earning quickly. Engaging the private sector in this process makes the training much more meaningful and effective. So this has to be emphasized. Reviewing the curriculum, providing opportunities like recognition for prior learning, reskilling and upskilling of youth when it comes to back to work is essential for returning children who are students who have lost their jobs or who want to go from school to work um, more meaningful and more practical. Practically, we've also seen the raise of interest in self-employment rather than wage employment because of the uncertainty of job security. Whenever there is a pandemic, there is a lockdown, we see that there's a, there, there are closures and the industries are closed or it's running on 50%. Youth tend to lose their jobs and there's limited jobs for those who are seeking new, new opportunities. So therefore youth are actually turning more towards uh, entrepreneurship development. So it's very important to try to integrate soft skills and entrepreneurial skills into the school curriculum so that children are ready for the world of work even if they even if you know they they are they are facing this kind of a pandemic where the the formal schooling is stop is stopping for for any reason but they still have the skills you know to go back and start something um, in their community or you know in the local market um, especially in the Asana, if you could start concluding yes i i'm 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 at the end of my uh, my deliberation but thank you very much Thanks, for Asana. for the opportunity yeah oh you're at the end sorry to interrupt you then but thank you. I think you brought out a lot of very important issues and a lot of it is based uh, on the years of experience that USEP has in this area. So it's all uh, experience-based, evidence-based points which we need to take forward in our thinking and planning and programming. Thank you, Dasina. 
So I'd like to move to the next presentation, which will be done by two researchers who will follow each other. Uh, Zaki Wajaz, who's reader of economics at the University of Kent and who will be followed just right after by Momoe Makino, who's a research fellow at the Institute of Develop Developing Economies. And they'll be speaking about the threat to female adolescents from COVID-19 and the early effects of COVID-19 uh, lockdown on the children. So I think uh, Zaki will start first. Please go Thank ahead. Thanks, Dr. Mahin. Um, so first, my thanks to IPA, uh, to Gage and to A2Y for organizing this event. Um, together with Momo, I'll present um, findings from two surveys conducted last summer, uh, which we hope will provide some insight about how the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is affecting um, uh, adolescent girls. Uh, the first piece of research is conducted um, was conducted with Amrit Amirapur at the University of Kent and Niaz Asadullah at the University of Malaya with funding from UK Aid. Next slide, please. So first I'd like to talk about how in theory the pandemic may affect upon um, adolescent girls. Uh, it has been argued that schools provide a safe space for adolescent girls and teachers and their classmates often play a critical role in preventing early marriages. And so therefore, while schools remain closed during the pandemic, uh, there's heightened risk of marriage among ad adolescent girls. Uh, since the start of the pandemic uh, last year, various stakeholders have also raised concerns that lockdowns limit the state's enforcement capacity, law enforcement capacity, uh, in particular monitoring and preventing underage marriages. Uh, and separately, that the return of city-based migrants to their villages following the position of the lockdown may have increased demand for, for brides and in particular um, uh, adolescent brides in, in rural areas. Um, there's also recent research indicating that negative economic shocks affect marriage timing, although whether it delays or accelerates marriage depends on the context. Uh, and there's early research which suggests that in the South Asian context, uh, marriages are used to forge social networks to provide insurance against future uncertainty. Now, since the pandemic constitutes a large negative economic shock uh, and may have increased um, uh, uncertainty about the future, uh, both of these mechanisms may have been present uh, and um, may have affected marriage timing among adolescent girls for those reasons. Next slide, please. So in this presentation of the next one by Momoe, we'll present findings from, from these two surveys. Um, to understand whether the pandemic and lockdowns increase the incidence of early marriage, we need to be able to compare with the incidence of early marriage prior to the pandemic uh, at the same point in the year. And the first of these two surveys, which is listed on this slide, allows us to do this uh, because this was a follow-up survey of a sample of 536 women uh, spread across 23 districts who had previously been interviewed in June 2018 and in May 2019, so in, in similar points of the, uh, in the year. Uh, and in these previous rounds, we had already collected detailed information on actual marriages, as well as any steps towards marriage among adolescent girls uh, of these respondents. So when we look at the new round in June 2020, it allows us to do a comparison over time. And the second survey um, um, conducted with Momoe and with Abu Shonjoy covers about 3,000 uh, rural households in Gaibanda district. Uh, and this larger sample, we um, um, uh, were able to use this larger sample to examine how different types of shocks associated with the pandemic may have uh, had potentially different effects on uh, adolescent girls. Next slide, please. So here in this figure, we see the timing of the two surveys in relation to the start of the pandemic and the lockdown period. The surveys were conducted from the middle of June to early July to 2020. And so they, so they give us a, a snapshot of the early effects of the pandemic on adolescent girls, and more specifically, the effects of the first countrywide lockdown. Next slide, please. So this slide provides um, the key takeaways from both surveys. So first, uh, we don't see uh, 
uh, any evidence of a spike in early marriages uh, due to the pandemic up to July 2020. But what we do see are more marriage-related activities um, uh, related to adolescent girls. Um, um, we see that uh, good uh, um, girls are more likely to have an outstanding marriage offer um, at the time of the survey compared to the same time in the previous year. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this in a couple of slides. Uh, and we also see that households which uh, experience more negative shocks are more likely to be engaging in marriage-related dis discussions for their um, adolescent daughters. Um, separately, we don't see any gender difference in probability of school continuation among school-aged children, but we do see decreased study time and increased household chores, and, the, and, and, and these changes are more severe in the case of girls than it is in the case of boys. Uh, if you could just click forward to the next part of the slide. Uh, so what you want to emphasize is that, of course, uh, what we're seeing over here is a snapshot of what was happening at an early stage of the pandemic. So uh, continued data collection is very important to understand the evolving patterns and, uh, and also very important for, uh, for informing policy. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this is a figure which is based on the first of the surveys, which allows a comparison of the incidence of early marriage over time. Uh, and you found so, somewhat to our surprise that there was actually a decline in marriages during the lockdown period, specifically from the 26th of March to the 12th of June, 2020, compared to exactly the same time period in the previous year, uh, that is in, in 2019. On the other hand, if you consider the pre-lockdown period from the 1st of January to the 25th of March, there was actually an increase uh, in the incidence of um, uh, early marriage compared to the same period in the previous year in 2019. Next slide, please. Uh, there are two other pieces of evidence from the same survey um, which are worth highlighting. Um, so first, in June 2020, when we um, conduct interviews with mothers and we ask about um, marriage offers that their daughters had received and whether they had responded to these offers, we found that there were twice as many adolescent girls who had received an, uh, uh, a marriage offer to, uh, to which they or their parents had not yet provided a response uh, compared to, uh, uh, to the same point in the previous year. And so perhaps parents were taking more of a wait and see approach to marriage proposals during the lockdown period. We also found that dowry costs became a much more important factor for refusing an offer of marriage during the lockdown period. This was a reason provided uh, for one out of every six refusals that we uh, recorded in our survey. Uh, and by contrast, um, um, uh, dowry costs were not provided as a, uh, as a reason for refusal at all uh, in the previous year. Next slide, please. So I will summarize the findings before handing over to Momoe to, to discuss the second um, uh, survey in more detail. Uh, the survey in June 2020 shows a sharp decline in marriages among adolescent girls during the lockdown period. Our data suggests that this may have been due to the fact that parents are taking longer to respond to marriage offers uh, and because they, they could not afford to pay dowries during the lockdown. But given that schools remain closed through last year, even after the lockdown was lifted and when the economy began to open up, marriages among adolescent girls may well have increased subsequently. Um, and so thanks for, for listening and now over to Momre. All right, um, this is Momoe uh, from Institute of Developing Economies and Population Council. This is our study on our effect of the COVID-19 lockdown based on rapid phone survey conducted June, July, 2020, uh, funded by uh, JSPS and the University of Kent. Next, please. Our rapid phone survey was conducted right after the economy reopened. But you can see that mobility was still limited in July. Please note that our study is based on the phone survey when the mobility was still limited. Next slide. The purpose of our phone survey was to explore the impacts of our policy responses. In other words, lockdown on adolescents. In particular, we focus on three variables, 
measuring the welfare of adolescents, namely time use of children, probability of children in school continuation, and incidence of uh, child marriage and marriage-related discussions. Given that mobility was uh, given that mobility was um, restricted at the time of phone survey, we expect it that marriage ceremony itself may be postponed. But the real threat of child marriage for adolescent girls can be measured by parental discussion about it. Next, please. As Zaki mentioned, a rapid phone survey called COGAB was based on two household surveys, focusing on unmarried girls, both of which were completed before the lockdown. I believe that the attrition rate was low as compared with similar surveys. Next, please. This is a summary statistics of two baseline surveys completed before the lockdown. Note that uh, as the survey focused on the household with at least one unmarried girls aged 13 and plus, more girls were naturally included in our sample than boys. Also, our focus was on unmarried girls, but 4% of girls who were unmarried at the time of listing of all eligible households married before the baseline survey. Next, pre next please. This figure described the early impacts of lockdown on the household. Note that around 40% of households have at least one member who lost his or her job. Among the households who had labor migrants prior to the lockdown, 60% experienced this decrease in remittances. In total household, they, um, total household, they represent 20%, which represent Gaibanda household, depending on labor migrants and remittances. It is alarming that 80% of households had to reduce the food consumption. Next, please. Around 80% of households answered that they had to decrease consumption to cope with shocks following lockdown. Most of household coping strategies were more likely to be borrowing or cutting in consumption. Next, please. This represents a uh, probability of children's school continuation and girls' marriage prospects and actual marriage incidents. No significant difference between boys and girls about the probability of their school continuation on the left, left figure, very limit, the middle figure, very limited number of girls are actually married since lockdown to the time of phone survey in June. But around 12%, the right slide, right figure, but around 12% of households started serious discussion about their daughter's marriage, which we consider the real threat to child marriage for adolescent girls under the limited mobility. Next, please. Though there's no gender difference in probability of school continuation, we found alarming difference in time use patterns between boys and girls. Uh, girls increased time spent on household chores and caring for other members of the household. And girls decreased at a time spent on study more than boys. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to summarize estimation result on child marriage outcome. Lockdown induced job loss decrease Lockdown in just a uh, job loss decreased the child marriage incidence, but increased the marriage related discussions. Similar patterns uh, were observed among households with health shocks. Similar to job loss effects, decrease in remittances also decreased child marriage incidence. But this decrease in marriage incidence can be also related to the lack of ceremony expenses due to economic shocks and mobility restrictions. If mobility restriction matters, once mobility comes back, child marriage may increase as being captured by increase in marriage-related discussions among um, affected households. Next slide, please. There is an uh, estimation result on probability of school continuation time use patterns. How shock and job loss increase the probability of children dropping out of school, but female return migrants had an opposite effect. No significant difference between boys and girls, consistent with Sarah's uh, at the same timing, but girls increased time spent on caring for others and household chores, and decreased time spent on study relative, relative to boys, as, as being consistent with the summary statistics I presented. Next slide, please. In sum, we didn't see any evidence of a spike in early marriage up to the time of survey, July 2020, but we found alarming evidence concerning girls' marriage, which is that household with economic shock have more marriage discussion. There was no evidence of gender discrimination in probability of school continuation, 
but we also found alarming evidence of less time spent on study and more time spent on household chores among girls, which may lead to go backward in terms of gender, dispar gender parity. Next slide, please. Given that our survey was conducted at the time of at the time, mobility was still restricted. Continued data correction is important to understand long-term effect on child marriage and schooling. And our school emphasizes, uh, and our study emphasizes the importance of considering gender dimension in policies with an aim to mitigate pandemic effects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Makino and Dr. Wahaj for this, both these presentations, you packed in a lot of information into a very short period of time, because I'm sure you're aware this is a, one of the burning questions on the ground that what effect is ha um, COVID having on child marriages? And you have problematized the issue by showing that there are lots of different things happening, which um, both uh, program people and policymakers need to take into account. So now we'd like to hear from Dr. Sajida Amin, who has a whole lot of experience of research on child marriage and adolescence empowerment. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Sajida Amin from the Population Council. Five minutes, Sajida. Thank you. Um, so uh, wonderful to hear these presentations and I'm very impressed, not surprised, but very impressed with the richness of the data on which the presentation is based. And I want to particularly uh, note that um, the both of these studies, as well as Sarah's, had a pre-pandemic um, benchmark to compare to, which is very essential in a lot of the conversations we are having on how uh, adolescents were affected. Um, I also particularly want to mention that um, I'm pleased to see how much uh, detail they've um, gone into and the emphasis on collecting time use, which shows some very nuanced and interesting variations, uh, both by gender um, and um, as well as sort of, I want to commend them for the emphasis on education as a mechanism and to spell out um, as both Zaki and Momo have done, what those mechanisms might be. So I'm going to be, uh, 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 a bit of a skeptic though, in terms of this emphasis on there was no spike in child marriage. Um, and I want to go back to Zaki's slide um, to um, encourage them to examine what I see as a slightly strange pattern, which is, uh, so yes, there seems to have been a, a less marriage, uh, but there were more marriages just before the lockdown. Um, in uh, 2020 as opposed to 2019. And why is that? It's almost like the population anticipated uh, the lockdown, which couldn't possibly have been the case. Uh, so um, I, I think there are various um, issues to consider in a retrospective recall of marriages, one of which is a recall bias um, uh, and how that could potentially have affected the reporting of marriages as to when they took place. Um, there, there may also have been some effect, although I'm not quite sure how that would have worked, um, because there is seasonality in marriage. We all know that. We know that marriages peak post harvest um, in rural Bangladesh in particular, but um, there may also have been an impact on uh, Ramadan when there are no marriages. So these are some points you might want to consider. Ramadan shifts by 10 days uh, between uh, each year. So could that have been something that explains the difference? And note that together the, in these two periods, the rates of marriage are approximately similar. So if it was a shift, it was a matter of timing, but that timing isn't explained. Sorry, that's too much detail. I want to go back to two findings that I found very important, like I said. One is the impact of migrants and migration, and the other is the impact on time use. But on time use, a lot of the interesting impact was on gender differences. But as Momo noted in her study, the, there was a big difference in the sample on the proportions of, um, of the sample that was male. 
Um, so it was, you needn't go back, only 20% of the sample was male. Now in any survey, in any normal survey, you would expect the same proportion of the sample to be male as female. So the fact that it was only 20% of the sample that was male, you have to consider the fact that the male sample was more selective than the female sample. Um, and I think I find uh, the other point I want to make is sort of the, the migrant ef effect is really interesting, but it's a little, I, I think that involves sort of deeper um, emphasis. Um, the other issue, so the two surveys, and this, is, this wasn't, we ran through it very quickly. Um, one is spread across 23 districts. The other is concentrated in Gaibanda. Now, we know that COVID has been extremely varied across the country. Um, higher incidence in Dhaka, Chittagong, and to some extent, Silet, if you look at IEDCR maps. So how might that have played out and how should we think about those patterns if you, um, uh, uh, in terms of the geographic specificity of these areas. But in some extremely rich and detailed data, but I would caution a little bit on this emphasis on there was no spike in marriage and uh, encourage you to look harder at the child marriage data in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sajidapa. Very interesting questions to dig deeper. Um, thank you for sticking to the time also. I think now we'd like to move to the next session, which is going to look at the role of incentives and uh, look at the insights from before COVID. And um, here we will have uh, the two researchers presenting, Dr. Shahana Nazneen, who is with IPA with the Girls Empowerment Project, and Kate Vio, sorry, Viborni, uh, who's with Duke University, research associate there. Um, so you both have 10 minutes. Please go ahead. Shahana? Uh, Shahana just messaged saying she can't hear. Would Kate like to start? Sure, I'm happy to, to go ahead. If, uh, should we give Shahana a minute or two to resolve the IT issue first? Or would you like me to go ahead? Um, Maybe you can start and she can come in as soon as she can. Sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so as, the, as mentioned on the title slide, this is uh, joint work with a broader team of researchers who've been uh, engaging in this study since 2007 in collaboration with a number of partners, including uh, Save the Children in, in rural Barishal district. Uh, so next slide, please. So, so uh, as, as uh, Mahinapa highlighted, what we wanted to share today is related to findings from before COVID um, about the impact of a set of, of uh, initiatives intended to empower adolescent girls and reduce child marriage, um, which we think has some implications for what policymakers should think about doing now during and after the, the COVID era. So this is a randomized control trial, which was designed to test two different programs, uh, which were assigned at the village level in Bayashal. The first was an empowerment program, Kishore Kwanta, or Adolescent Women's Voices, um, which was, which was uh, uh, a curriculum similar to the curricula implemented by many partners. I can't hear anything. Shahana, are you able to hear us now? No, she said she can't hear anything. I think okay, I'll, I'll continue, continue and, unless please, we're able to, to yeah. get her reconnected. Sorry okay, about that. Thanks. Um, so, so the first is a is an empowerment program to share a contact. The second is a conditional stipend program, which is different from many other previous stipend programs, like the uh, well, like the study the well studied secondary school stipend program in Bangladesh because it doesn't require girls to be in school. It only requires that they stay unmarried until they're 18 years old. 
Um, so that it was implemented by Save the Children and the Nike Foundation in Rural Bayashal. And it started in 2007. So this we're now talking about um, quite a long, a long time ago. And we're now getting ready to do some follow-up data collection it, this year and next year in collaboration with BRAC School of Public Health, JPG. Next slide, please. So the uh, intervention, the first intervention that was tested was, was an, this after-school empowerment program, Kishore Khan said, was run by girls ages, and it was targeted at a wide range of adolescent girls from 10 to 19 years old. And it included a number of different components, including uh, 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 peer education, work together on schoolwork, uh, development of life skills through role playing and development of negotiation skills and other kinds of activities, as well as education on um, a number of important uh, uh, topics like reproductive health and nutrition. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yes, thank you. <clears throat> The alternative program that was cross randomized with this, with this first, with the Kishore Konta program was this stipend. So the stipend was an in kind stipend. It wasn't cash, but rather cooking oil. So families would receive four liters of cooking oil three times a year if they kept their daughters, un, as long as they kept their daughters unmarried. And that was wor the worth of that added up to about $16 in, in US terms um, a year, and it could, it, they, they could receive it up to two years. So that was targeted at, at girls who were unmarried at the beginning of the study between 15 and 17 years old. Uh, so the idea is basically that in the randomized trial, uh, the team uh, had some villages that received one of these programs, some villages that received the second program, some villages that received both, and then uh, a fourth group of villages that just went on as usual, a control group where there was no new intervention happening. And so this allows us to look at how effective is each of these at achieving uh, a number of different outcomes of interest for young women, including reducing child marriage, increasing education, and improving, improving their health. Next slide, please. Um, so yes, I think, sorry, I think this is what I've uh, just mentioned that there were some villages in each of these, uh, each of these possible combinations. So that because this was randomly assigned, it makes it possible for us to, uh, to look at the impact of each one as well as how they combine with each other. Next slide, please. So uh, the findings we think are very exciting. There's a, there's a lot to unpack and the, the, the broader research team has several research papers going into a lot of detail about this. It's a very short presentation. So we'll just highlight a couple of the important ones. The first is that the stipend program where the families received oil in, uh, as a on the condition that they kept their daughters unmarried uh, was very effective at reducing child marriage and reducing teenage childbearing. So uh, uh, girls who were in the, sti the stipend villages were 21% less likely to get married under 18 and 28% less likely to get married under 16 um, and 11% less likely to have, have babies when they were still in their own teenage years. The empowerment program actually did not change the possibility of getting married as a teenager. So it had other beneficial uh, effects, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but it was not effective at reducing teenage marriage. Next slide, please. Uh, both this, both of the different programs uh, were were effective at increasing education. So, girls who were eligible for the the stipend program were 13 percent more likely to still be studying when they were in their early 20s, and those who were eligible for the empowerment program, six percent more likely to be studying. Um, so overall, uh, the, this, there was an increase of, of uh, two to two point five months of uh, a total schooling, and the the I should have said here that everything I'm showing um, in the in these slides is related to the the last wave of follow up data collection, which the team did at six years after the program started. So we're getting ready to survey them again now, fifteen years after the program started, in order to understand the long long run impact. But at, the, at this time, when they were in their early 20s, um, there were, we were already seeing these benefits in terms of reduced, reduced uh, teenage marriage and increased education. And that we will see now how, how that uh, continued to play out. Next slide, please. Um, OK, great. Uh, so the, the other kind of uh, exciting outcome of this, of, this inter of this program was that the empowerment program, Kishore Kanta, actually increased uh, girls' probability of working and doing some sort of income generating activity. So these are, this could be working in a formal sense, like going to a job in a garment factory or working as a tutor. It could be 
um, doing activities within the household that bring in income for herself, like uh, farm related or livestock related activities. But across, you know, when we measure across those, there's a, a significant increase. And in fact, there's uh, an 80% uh, an increase in the probability that girls by the early 20s are more likely to, an uh, 80% uh, more likely to, to be currently working at that point in time. Um, the, so the, this was the empowerment program, the, the group girls program, Kishore Kanta, the stipend treatment in contrast with the oil did not have any impact on the probability of working by the girls early 20s. Next slide, please. So, so the team has done an analysis of the cost effectiveness of this program relative to uh, a number of other benchmarking it against a number of other different possible uh, interventions and found that it's it, we, we only here are looking at some aspects of the benefits it's there's obviously a lot of different potential benefits to empowering adolescent women um, there's an increase in their education and decrease in their child marriage and ultimately that can affect them in many different ways including their health and their children's health in this analysis we're only just looking at one thing which is the fact that they are uh, staying in school longer and what we find is that the, the, just by that margin, the program compares favorably to many other programs uh, that have been implemented, including this is, the, the, it, this is also including, um, I think the labeling of the graph is a little confusing here, but this, this, this comparison has also benchmarked against the, the female sti school stipend program in Bangladesh, as well as other programs in, that are sim have similar objectives in other countries. So this is a really good, investment of, of funds in terms of uh, uh, investing in these young women who ultimately will uh, uh, study longer, um, have a better education and, uh, and a more productive life and a, a better off life in the long term. Next slide, please. So what is all of this to do with COVID? Well, I've told you that this is, this is you know, this program was implemented in 2007. Isn't this kind of a long time ago? Uh, yes, it is a long time ago, but uh, and we think that it's very relevant to thinking about the concerns that have come up today. So all of the previous presenters really highlighted a lot of the risks and vulnerabilities that young women are facing in the time of the of COVID lockdowns. So a few things to kind of think about. The first is that it's very clear, and this has been highlighted by other presenters as well, that families really are making a decision about daughter's education and marriage jointly. So right now, as schools have been closed or closed and reopened and closed, again, um, over this past year in, in Bangladesh, as in many other contexts, this issue of whether the girl is going back to school or not, it may be like, related to this question of, is she gonna get married or not? And so this may be like a key transition point that we need to worry about in terms of uh, uh, a, a young woman's life could go in kind of one direction or another, depending on whether, whether she does re-enter school or whether she goes into, uh, whether she goes into, uh, in, into an early marriage. And related to that, we really need to think a lot about, we, you know, we tend to think a lot about, well, child marriage is a social norm. There's certainly an important social norms component of it, but there's like, it doesn't mean that it's not responsive to financial concerns. As the other presenters have also talked about, you know, questions around dowry and how we're going to come up with the money. Um, the, this is kind of the flip side of that. It, it, fi the financials really affect families' calculations about when they should uh, decide that their daughter should be married. And we can take advantage of that with very, very inexpensive, highly cost-effective programs, um, such as the ones studied in this in this RCT. So, uh, financial transfer is conditional on staying unmarried, as studied here, or staying in school, like the school stipend program that's that, that's been studied by other researchers, um, can be really effective. And we should be thinking about whether we should incorporate this as part of social protection and relief packages during the COVID era. Um, finally, we should. We, it's also worth pointing out that the empowerment program in, pretty substantially increased the probability that, that young women started to work and earn. And th there's a whole other kind of set of questions here that we should be exploring and that we hope to explore in the future in this research, in, this, in the longer term um, of this research project, which is to understand is, so when you, when you empower women to play a role in the financial uh, uh, income of the household, even if it's a small role, like ha having uh, uh, a small amount of livestock activity or a larger role, like taking a full-time job at, um, of some sort, that, that might sort of uh, help them be more resilient to shocks like the COVID lockdown related shocks. So if the family is relying on one income, even if it's a good income, if it suddenly goes away because of an event like this, 
they're put in a really difficult situation. Perhaps if there are multiple earners, you know, the man and the woman or multiple members of the household are, are able to earn, they'll be in a better position to, um, to weather that shock because one person might lose their job, the other person might be able to increase their work accordingly. And so we hope to be able to understand more about that in the, in the future. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you, Dr. Vaiborni. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't connect Dr. Nazneen, but thank you for taking over the presentation. Um, all three presentations have brought in a lot of evidence, a lot of questions as well, a lot of information, um, which are very important now to be taken into account by policymakers, by people um, implementing and designing programs. And we would like to hear now from two discussants who we have invited to precisely reflect on these uh, findings and the evidence which has been given. So I would first like to um, invite uh, Mr. Abzal Hossein Sarwar, who's policy specialist at the A2I program at the ICT division. Um, Sarwar, why you have five minutes? Uh, thank you, Mahina. Can you hear me clearly? Hello. We can hear Hello. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and participants who are engaged here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, that that very timely discussion uh, has been uh, taking place and uh, I'm really honored to be invited here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, IPA, Minister of Education, and the other stakeholders uh, for arranging such a very important discussion. Uh, though it has been discussed, but uh, we all know that uh, the coronavirus pandemic has forced the world to bow down from all the sectors of development, including health, care system, education, business, and economics. Uh, and the education sector is one of the worst sufferers we know. And uh, it has uh, forced all the educational institutions remain closed for uh, an indefinite time, hampering regular academic activities. But uh, uh, how about handling the situation quite well using different tools and digital technologies like television, online platform, radio, mobile phones, etc. cetera. Uh, but very important thing is that uh, as uh, we are discussing about the adolescent, uh, especially the girls uh, during this pandemic. So when the regular activities uh, is taking place in a schools or institution, they got the environment to share, to discuss many issues. But during, during this pandemic, we saw as they are staying at home uh, uh, for a indefinite time. And so many issues like uh, anxiety, mental health, well-being, uh, these have come up uh, for discussion and uh, the government and the other stakeholders are discussing on that issue to uh, make some uh, effective uh, uh, initiatives for them. And uh, one thing, uh, this is very alarming that uh, due to pandemic, probably we need to think about the dropout and learning loss due to uh, the earning loss or earning decrease uh, about the parents that, that Sarah mentioned in some of our slides. And uh, it is also indicating that uh, the marriage increase trend can be happening. So uh, for the other issues uh, in the um, slides that shared by Kate, uh, I'd also like to mention that the empowerment through stipend program or other programs. Uh, so uh, as we have uh, listened to uh, our two initiatives, but uh, you also know that in Bangladesh, uh, we have made some good progress uh, for women education uh, uh, by facilitating uh, the stipend program for secondary school assistant program and also for primary education stipend program. And Bangladesh is really doing uh, well here. But uh, beside this, I would like to mention that uh, uh, empowering uh, by stipend program or similar kind of initiatives definitely will be helpful, but uh, it will be more, uh, I think, effective if we can uh, highlight or uh, bring some initiatives for our adolescents, especially the girls, uh, like uh, income generating activities with 
some essential skills development like regard skills or entrepreneurship skills uh, definitely with education so that they can be prepared for the future or future job market uh, to cope up and uh, one thing uh, i would like to mention here that uh, uh, many researchers and uh, the discussion also mentioned about the continuing education so we need to ensure a proper and inclusive equal opportunity for the adolescent especially for both the boys and girls and from the government uh, from the minister of education and from the directors uh, some of the initiatives uh, have been undertaken and also uh, thinking of for developing a uh, an education ecosystem where the marginalized, underserved, and all kind of learners uh, will be, uh, I mean, uh, will get the equal opportunity. So uh, I'll stop here by saying that uh, definitely uh, this, the stipend uh, initiatives or program can be helpful for empowering our uh, adolescent girl or women. But in the future, we need to also ensure that uh, with some very specific uh, skills, especially soft skills and uh, uh, and the entrepreneurship skills will be helpful for the employment in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mayra. Over to you. Thank you, Sir Wadwai. It's very interesting to listen to what the government and your um, division is thinking about in terms of what might be taken forward. Now we'd like to listen to Raihan Appa. Um, who is with the Directorate for Secondary and Higher Education. Uh, Raihan Appa, you also have five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, clearly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thanks uh, to Ashraf Bhai and uh, Mahin Sultan Appa to uh, say something uh, like this time type of uh, tremendous, I think, uh, program. Uh, I also impressed at this uh, research because uh, I think the most important things had been already um, come to light in our, in our, in front of us. So I'm just uh, going to, uh, thanks to these um, three, researchers three three presentations i we have already observed the that the 2220 schools over the chitang and Silet areas there there was the 54 percent female was there the sample as the first uh, which is um, presented by sara and uh, their findings was the 83 percent income loss we know about these things uh, all over the country you know uh, especially for the pandemic situation, you know. And uh, we have observed the uh, about education uh, from Sarah's presentation, 22% uh, with teacher only, the girls. And uh, almost the uh, boys and girls, almost the same uh, in the three presentations we have observed. And uh, another thing I have observed from the um, Jackie's, Mr. Jackie's and uh, Manik, uh, Makino, Makino's presentation. This is the uh, risk of early marriage, you know. I want to uh, yes, um, share with you from the government portion, you know, the from government portion, we have uh, tried, government, Bangladesh government is tried to uh, um, address these things, these type of problems and the uh, uh, especially the pandemic situations, you know. Uh, our, uh, I, am, I want to just uh, initiatives from government, uh, just express my, um, some experience or the, some data from here. You know, the, <clears throat> from World Population Report 2015, we know 47.6 million kids are 10 to 20, 24 years. So, uh, from government initiatives, the community health workers, NGOs, and uh, others, uh, non-government organizations have um, so many initiatives there by them. But Ministry of Child uh, Affairs, you know, they just uh, taking 
uh, some initiatives from from government portion we uh, from our ministry of education you know the directorate of secondary edu directorate of secondary and higher education we are uh, continuing a pro project this is called generation breakthrough this is for uh, ministry of education for the adolescent child you know so from uh, these initiatives we have uh, 1 million taka for this only uh, the potuakhali jamalpur shirazganj molubi bazar and rangamati this is from 2019 to 22 uh, and before that from 2014 to 2018 it was uh, in it, this initiatives was taken from uh, women and child affairs ministry this was involved 250 institutions and uh, after this generation breakthrough uh, second phase, you know, they are working uh, for the adolescents the, from how, how can tackle their emotion, emotion management and, you know, the GEMS session. This is the, uh, for the gender, mental health and mental and physical um, health and physical hy hygiene like that. And uh, Generation Breakthrough, this is the a multi-pronged approach of primary prevention of defined gender gender-based violence and uh, uh, you know sexual and reproductive health rights needs of adolescents of youth in Bangladesh. For so and from UNICEF, you know, we are uh, already working with the with the um, institutions of Bangladesh for. Uh, adolescents and uh, after that the generation breakthrough we are going to uh, take, Bangladesh government already Ministry of Education and taking a program secondary education development program which is called SEDP and they also uh, uh, initiated a scheme for adolescent students program which name is ASP so um, I think um, from government portion we government already try to do for that adolescence, especially for the uh, COVID-19 situation, you know, from the Directorate of Secondary and Higher Education, uh, they are uh, already taking some initiatives for the uh, children's mental health, you know. Uh, so um, if we continue this effort, and I also, I also talked to uh, Sarah, and um, requested to Mahinapa, if you if you provide us the the presentations, the the research, then we will talk. Especially, I can assure that I will uh, share with my high officials, my colleagues, and my DG. So, if we uh, uh, get these things, this uh, research. So we will try to uh, in initiative for which which place we, we need to address. So uh, I I just uh, want to request to uh, Mahinapa uh, if you agree with me, then you can please um, disseminate with us. And finally, I I want to uh, say that we have to make a plan. To utilize those youth, those uh, girls, uh, adolescents who are the uh, suffered from several severe uh, problems. Uh, we, we just observed that somebody cannot return to school, so we need to address them. We need to notice them, notice uh, these things. So thank you, thank you so much uh, for from my end. Uh, over to Mahinapa. Thank you. Thank you, Rayanapa. That was very useful, especially that you briefed everybody on the different government initiatives that are happening, um, what you're doing to take on board uh, the COVID situation, and um, the slides and uh, the different um, uh, publications and policy briefs that have been prepared by the different teams. All the links will be shared with everybody who's attended there. Um, 
I think uh, IPA will be sending those out to all those who have participated this evening. So, um, and if uh, I'm sure the different research teams would be very happy to engage with the Ministry of Education if you were to want further meetings or discussions around the research findings. So thank you, both of you. I think we now just have about 15 minutes that um, to open up the floor if people have questions or comments, obviously uh, to the point and very short because we'd like to hear from as many people as possible. I've seen some uh, smaller comments have been addressed already between the different teams. Um, so if you'd like to speak, please just uh, raise your hand and you can have the floor. Or if any of the discussants would like to add anything that they didn't get a chance to uh, earlier on. Can I just uh, mention, uh, can I just make one point? Please. Yes, uh, so this is uh, Jigang Li of uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, so uh, thank you for the important workshop and the studies. I just want to make one point. So ADB conducted a study uh, using this S secondary uh, development program, SCDP uh, data to study the impact of uh, uh, stipend programs on the, the girls' uh, education. So. Uh, so we'll be very interested in the, having a discussion with Kate and her team uh, for future possible collaboration. Yeah. Thank you. And I saw um, Mr. Lee also shared a link to the reports if people are interested in looking at those. Um, I see a question in the chat from Dr. Niaz Asadullah. Would you like to um, pose your question or should I just read it out? Okay, let me read it out. Um, regarding the first presentation, how should we interpret the statistics considering the fact that Silet and Chittagong are not only two of the most economically prosperous regions of Bangladesh, education infrastructure and marriage norms, oops, sorry, are also different from the rest of the country. So that's to Sarah. Sure, I, I can start and then Mahi, maybe you can add since um, you, you probably know yeah. better better than me. So I think, you know, it, the findings should be interpreted as, as relevant to that population, right? So a, a school-based, you know, we sampled, we did in-school sampling. So these are adolescents that are in seventh and eighth grade and in rural and urban Chittagong and Select. And so I think the findings should be interpreted with um, under, within that context. The only thing I will say is we also have samples in, in Dhaka um, and uh, a sample in, in Cox Bazar, both refugees and host. And so we have a broader set of samples in Bangladesh to which we can compare the Chittagong and Silet findings um, to. Uh, Maheen, anything you'd like to add? Yes, just that, I mean, both Silet and Chittagong, we found large differences between the more remote areas and the more economically prosperous and more central areas. So even within those divisions, you know, there are lots of differences in those uh, populations, though they were mostly school going, they were all school going. Yeah, yeah. and also to add one more point, um, when we selected Chittagong and uh, Silet, we compared these two regions with other regions in the country and we found that the rate of child marriage and education are lower, lowest in Chittagong and Silet compared to other divisions in Bangladesh. Yeah, that's part of the contradictions that, you know, it might be economically prosperous, but on in other indicators, uh, it's not as uh, positive. Uh, Mainapa, if you okay. uh, get a chance Absolutely. for one. Sir, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Appa. Uh, actually, I would like to add some uh, more points uh, regarding uh, for the parents as well, that we need to uh, initiate or build some of the program or awareness building program regarding child marriage and uh, the girls' empowerment and digital literacy that uh, Rahan Appa mentioned, uh, generation 
breakthrough program of the uh, Ministry of Education is trying to uh, I mean, facilitate. And uh, more counseling program on adolescent development like uh, Alapun program of Connect. Probably you have uh, known about Connect that uh, Connect is a adolescent, a, a platform for adolescent for their, uh, I mean, uh, different soft skills uh, and different awareness building and soft skills development program and for building their creativity and uh, we are col uh, in collaboration with unfpa uh, we are uh, discussing with so many psychosocial issues and mental health issues of the adolescents and uh, you know probably about the ministry of women uh, and child affairs uh, there they have the kishore kishori club and uh, other learning clubs that kind of, uh, I mean, initiative or, or learning clubs at uh, school uh, when uh, the schools will be reopening. Uh, so this kind of initiatives or activities uh, can be helpful for sharing their anxiety, curiosity, and uh, with other friends. And some more extracurricular activities or after school programs can be undertaken uh, for uh, under social networking and other connect activities. And also, as I mentioned about some uh, skills development course. So from connect, we are trying to facilitate some of the short courses on game development and uh, career guideline program and uh, other soft skills. So I think uh, these kind of uh, initiatives uh, or programs can be also helpful for our adolescents to be prepared for the future and future job market. Thank you, Maina, for giving me the opportunity. No, to thank say. you very much. Because some of what you were saying Maina, is also- Maina, I, I want one minute from you. Sure. <laughs> Raina, 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 please. Maina, please. Yes. Yes, one more thing I want to add, uh, please. Uh, and uh, already um, Sarwar Bhai mentioned here. So I want to add here, you know, uh, from our, I, I just forgot in the time, uh, from Ministry of Health and Family uh, Health and Family Welfare, you know, the National Strategy for Adolescents Health 2017 to 2030. It's already prepared, you know. And uh, from the Shornokishuri Foundation, you know, we, we all are knows uh, we all knows that the Shornokishuri Foundation uh, they are working for the adolescent girls to through all over the countries. And uh, from Ministry of Education, we have another uh, program that is the wash block for girls for girls in the um, uh, schools yeah, so the from uh, directorate of secondary ed education and higher education you know tqi2 uh, this is the teaching quality improvement in secondary education program i was uh, i worked there as a deputy project director uh, so we work a lot for the adolescents girls for the institutions also and another uh, project was there, the Sekai project. They already prepared and uh, from SESI, you know, another uh, program is running now. Uh, at the end of the program, they just uh, prepared the wash blocks from the, from the girls uh, in, in the institution, the different wash blocks, special wash blocks. And, uh, and so many initiatives um, from uh, uh, government, you know, so, so uh, I can't uh, remember at that time the, all the things. So if we uh, continue our, our, our effort, uh, we think, we hope so that the, we will we'll reach at our, um, just uh, which we, we are thinking about who, who, where we want to go, then we will reach uh, there. Thank you so much. Exactly. So there are so many different initiatives and it's also important to know how, which one, how effective the different initiatives are, what sort of effect they're having, who they're reaching, who they're leaving out. Um, I just saw a comment from Sajidapa saying that to endorse the idea of the adolescent clubs, which her research has shown the kind of um, very positive effects it can have. So we need to build on what we're learning through this research on the different program interventions so that you know, we can strengthen the ones that need strengthening and take them further. Um, Ishrat Jahan, I saw had a number of questions. Have they been answered or do you want to raise anything? Yeah. 
No. Then, uh, unless there any, there's anything else, I think I can, uh, there's, uh, okay, there are different links coming up. Uh, if there are no other questions, then I think I can hand back to Ashraf Bhai in good time. Uh, thank you, Mahinapa. Um, so um, across the three studies, um, we learned a few things, uh, if I summarize. One is adolescents, both boys and girls, have increased pressure to do household chores, which could be a risk factor uh, to increase dropouts when schools will reopen. Uh, second, uh, food security is a big issue at this moment for adolescents, uh, and, and that might have uh, impact on dropouts or doing worse when schools will reopen because nutrition and learning are correlated. Um, the good news is, though we have not seen any spike on child marriage, but uh, the downside is there are a lot of discussions on marriage-related um, uh, proposals, and there could be a spike in marriages once economy turns um, uh, back to its normal uh, normality. So all these things together, uh, we need to think about how we can make sure our boys and girls are safely uh, returning to schools and that they are doing well when uh, they will restart um, uh, their educational activities. Um, the good thing is also we, we have seen our government um, and, uh, policy discussions, um, uh, they, they showed their openness to uh, consider research findings to design or redesign their current programs. There are like many programs that governments are running and we don't need like think about a whole new program. So we can just uh, feed in these findings to government and government can just tweak their current programs and, and make uh, significant differences um, positively. So thank you very much uh, for attending uh, our webinar today. And I especially thank to the presenters uh, and researchers who, who uh, whose findings actually helped us to um, uh, to get together and discuss uh, some policy relevant uh, uh, utilization of it. Uh, I also thank our policy discussions and uh, and the uh, and, and, and participants from the government. And I hope uh, this is a good start but we will be able to continue the discussion uh, uh, forward so that we can make some real changes and make some uh, uh, good uh, uh, to our adolescents and their lives. Uh, again, thank you very much, but we will be in touch very soon uh, with uh, um, uh, PowerPoint presentations and other relevant resources. And, uh, but, but meanwhile, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to IPA, to me, or to our researchers directly. Thank you very much.